So I want to begin by asking you what is it, uh, how, how important it is and how you, with each film and each you know, uh, piece of work that you do, you bring in this quality, this quality of openness and questioning. Thank you. I mean, I, I don't know that um, necessarily you go in wanting to bring that in or not, but certainly I do. I mean, you know, I was pretty young when I made Unlimited Girls in the mm -hmm. sense that I had been working for a few years, but I don't think that to work for uh, eight or nine years at that time meant the same thing as now because everything was so much slower, right? Like when I started as an assistant, we were working on 16 millimeter and then Umatic came, then Vita came. And by the time we made Unlimited Girls, Mukul would have seen the VX1000 being put in and you know, it's like early digital cameras are coming in. So <clears throat> earlier, if you made a film, it would take two or three years and there were so many processes and you'd go to the lab and all that. So amount of work you did in a certain time period was much less than what you do now in eight or 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that I was thinking consciously, meaning I was, uh, I was thinking to myself, like, what was I thinking when I was making the film? And I think mostly I just wanted to make a film that felt true to whatever I was, right? Like all the things that I liked, all the things that I was seeing around me. And uh, I think digital video did make it possible to, you know, bring in a kind of attention to the things that we attended to in everyday life. For example, I remember that Madhushri Datta made a film called Made in India at the same time. And that um, robot which tells the future on the beach, there's a shot of it in our film as well. So there were things that we were all doing and things that we were seeing and thinking about that find their way into the film. But I think I was lucky when I made Unlimited Girls because uh, as I was telling Subhishri outside that I also had that thing of, I'm gonna show everybody like, you know, all these older feminists always making us feel like we are so silly, but I can show them, I'm gonna show them what I'm made of type of thing. But the experience of uh, interviewing people, of having to study what has gone before you, of reading all these transcripts of conferences that had been happening or meetings that had been happening in the 70s, it actually really helped me to see a process that takes place where people disagree, they come back to that same table, they change their minds, they modify who they are. And I think uh, I wanted to mirror that in the film. Um, when I was making the film, I also started talking to a lot of people about feminism just randomly, like, what do you think about feminism? And I would find really unlikely people saying that I think I'm a feminist. Like I remember my cousin who, you know, you'd never think she'll say it. She was in a very bad marriage and in a very oppressed, classically oppressed situation. She said, no, I think I'm a feminist. And I asked her, why do you say that? And she said, because I'm not willing to give back the freedoms that I have. But the thing is, and my other cousin, her sister, who's, you know, got divorced when she was very young and has had a very like dabang kind of personality. Everybody's scared of her in the family, all of that. She said, no, no, I don't think I'm a feminist. So this was also very interesting to me that what you expected and what people said were so different from each other. But I think it slightly shaped how I was approaching things. Uh, and I know I'm giving a slightly scattered response to what you're saying, but I think a very important thing that happened to me in my 20s was that I ended up living in this tenement housing colony. So I think I was a, a infrequent middle class person who got declassed by actually living with working class people. So in a way, you understand that you understand the insufficiency of ideology. You see yourself with other people and how you behave who are very different from you. When you're neighbors with somebody, you see your own limits in how intimate you can be with someone who's very different from you. You also see how people treat you not necessarily uh, with suspicion or, you know, like say middle class activists would always say that you must dress in a salwar kameez when you come to the workers area. But actually workers themselves were not expecting it of me. Like workers would feel like, why aren't you getting a properly paid job? You're so educated and you're like roaming around shooting our morchas, you know. So I, I feel like all of this actually reshaped the way that I thought about what is political. And uh, yes, also living in Bombay and the fact that just to earn a living, I ended up working in TV or film or whatever. You know, it all created a kind of heterogeneous space in which you understand that life is not in neat boxes. And actually what we want is a set of questions that we can meditate on and help us to make sense of our lives and our relationships with each other. And yeah, if we really believe that uh, politics is something that helps us to make life, make, make hope a more meaningful word, then I don't think there's a way forward without really trying to understand somebody who's very different from you. So I think that has certainly, I mean, Unlimited Girls was a great opportunity to start thinking about that. And I think that with every film, I got a chance to think about it in different ways. So it became a habit in a way.
Yeah, and I think this is the quality that makes it ageless, you know, and relevant. Uh, because a colleague of mine who is 30 years old and, uh, you know, she's going through her own set of things in life. And she, so I made her see this film and she reacted in the same way that I did so many years back when I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I do today. So it is, it is relevant, it is ageless, and that's the magic of it. <laughs> Thank you. You know, Shubha and I were in fact discussing this uh, to try and understand your use of humor, which is fantastic. And you know, the, the ads always crack me up. Uh, how you use the humor as a trope to understand uh, the political, to understand, you know, these complex uh, notions and ideas. Well, I mean, I think like people ask this question about humor a lot, but I think like it also depends on your personality, right? Like for me, humor is a natural way of being. So I think it translates into the film that I also like, I'm naturally drawn to the kind of people who have that sense of irony and humor, even when I'm looking for interview subjects or like in Bombay, it's easy to find people with a very stylish sense of irony, right? So in when we were making Q2P, we interviewed some, we went on a practice shoot day, which mostly involved going into station loose and shooting them, uh, which was very traumatic for all of us. And when we came outside onto the street, we interviewed some guys who were standing in a corner about why there was no women's loo. But that sequence made it into the film. The thing is like all of the guys in the film, although when audiences watch, they're like, how are they saying that our culture is this way? And if they go to the and all. But actually they all have a kind of little bit of a smile while they're speaking. So they themselves are performing and finding themselves quite entertaining. And they also want to entertain you. And I feel that I really respond well to people because, you know, I hate to be bored. And I've got a great fear of boring others. So this, I think that somehow enters. But... I, I recently read an essay which I think explained to me why humor is so important to me also by Barbara Ehrenreich, who's a writer I love. And she talks about uh, paleontology, paleontological art, like cave paintings, and what we come to know about our ancestors from cave paintings. And one of the things that she says is that they seem to be very humorous. And in their paintings, there's a sense that we're all meat because there are these huge megafauna which are eating people. And it's that they know they are meat. And that's kind of funny that you know your dead meat in a sense, right? And the importance of humor is that it, it, uh, it makes you accept your place in the world and it links you to other people. Like I said, there's a knowledge of hierarchy and an acceptance of that hierarchy without, I don't know, since false sense of righteousness, let's say. And that especially when you look at the natural world, you see these other ways of coexisting. And I do think that one of the remarkable things about the current political discourses is humorlessness, right? Mm -hmm. There's such a certitude that, you know, ask me how I've suffered. And, and, and there's no sense of humor about the fact that you're performing this suffering for each other while being in a space of privilege, right? So I think that humor in that sense keeps it real, for lack of a better phrase, but it also allows you to have a compassion for yourself and others without overdoing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll uh, open the session up. You know, sometimes kids, when they're crying, they start laughing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they know that they are crying extra to convince you. Yeah. And then you look at them like, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and then they also start laughing and say, but no, you know. So I feel that humor, you see it in children too. Like they're like, I'm trying to get something. Yeah. Okay, it didn't work. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Next strategy. <laughs> so, so I think I like that humility in humor. Yeah. So humor we know and we have seen your work and I'm a great fan of your work. Thank you. Especially uh, Agents of Ishka also and the movie that you made. Uh, so so which are the subjects uh, that interest you and what in future we can, you know, see coming from you? Is it spontaneous or is there a method to that madness, I mean, which you try to bring into your... You know, I mean, madness is the most method methodical of things. I'm sure you know that. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I think that like gender and feminism is not an interest, you know, it's a perspective. And it's interwoven in almost anything that I would do. But like with everybody, it's one perspective amongst many that you bring. And I have made films that, like I made a film on piracy and copyright, which on the surface of it may not have anything to do with gender. But I feel feminism informs the way that I look look at everything. So I don't think it will ever be outside anything that I do. But lots of things interest me. Like, I mean, I, like now I have suddenly become very interested in people who are like taking people on walks to understand trees. I never thought the day would come when such a thing would interest me. So you don't really know, like anything in the world interests me. But I like, I guess I feel interested in how people live just how people live, their relationship to art and their relationship to each other. So I cannot say what the next thing will be that will interest me. So, yeah. yeah. I have a comment and a question. Um, this is the first film by you that I'm watching, but I've read some of your essays and I really like how you 
use popular culture along with theorization and not in a way that's that is a spoof but you develop a poetics that says this is our culture and who says what culture is and who says what political popular culture is or so i really like the way that that flows in your work Thank in textual you. and visual Thank you very much. Um, my question is that I uh, I can see, and you you said that you were grappling with these uh, at a younger time, and now you ha now having arrived at this, do you think that sometimes as an artist you find yourself um, anxious about having to assume a bigger bigger political responsibility when you make personal choices? Do you f have you arrived at something? I like don't think that? I've arrived anywhere, so I'm like <laughs> making like squirming when you're saying arrived at. Uh, I haven't exactly answered your question. Do you think, are you saying I feel that my every personal choice is loaded with political significance? Yes. No, I think I'm not famous enough, luckily, to really worry about it. I mean, I think... You are, Paru. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I am. So maybe that is good for me. But I think like we all worry. I don't think you have to be well known or otherwise now. I think everybody worries about being trolled online because your every gesture, your every articulation, your every word is now like filtered through some sensor the whole world is a sensor board, right? We don't need the CBFC because we got each other. So great, uh, you get nightmares and you, and it is, I think it's about, I, I, I wouldn't uh, state it as worrying about the political significance because I think you try to be politically true to yourself. That keeps changing what that means. And I don't think that you can assume this kind of uh, seer role and say that every political, just because I am a feminist, that means everything I do equals feminism, right? Like it's a work in progress and we're all trying and trying to be good people, I suppose, to put it in a simple way. And sometimes we succeed and sometimes we fail. How have you used humor to bring out heartbreak in your work? Uh, what do you mean by heartbreaking? Uh, <laughs> there's something that makes you cry, but you know, not like the child crying and then you look at the child and he starts laughing or she starts laughing, but something that worked that really hurts you so much mm. and you only know and you want to use humor to bring that out. So, you know, I think like maybe um, a lot of things in the world can make you feel very sad, right? Uh, I don't know that necessarily I make films about those kinds of things because I'm often interested in looking for possibility. And I think that uh, like say, for example, in Q2P, which is a film about toilets, uh, there are obviously situations which we filmed in which people don't have access to basic things but i'm very uncomfortable by uh, with portraying people as having nothing because i feel people always have something of themselves in them right so i'm and i don't think that films should not be made about deprivation i think they should be but it's a very complicated thing how do you depict somebody's lack without depicting them as nothing but equal to a person of lack right so what ends up happening is if for example uh, in fact my friend samina zia and she was a sound recordist for this we were shooting in Khan Market in the fancy loose and there were, so we asked the men in charge, the head of the sanitation department that there are no women in your department. And he said, there are. And two women who were sweepers were brought in and they said, see, we have women, Nasafai Karamcharis are there, whatever. Now there's a number of ways in which you can look at that. It's kind of a horrible thing that uh, they speak so casually about caste and gender. But the thing is that when we started interviewing and then I was a little bit stumped and uh, Samina said to me from behind, Ask them where they go to the loo, right? So then I said, so when you have, when you go to the loo, where do you go? And they were like, ye kaisa sawal hai. you know, <laughs> jate hai, bathroom jate hai. so this thing that in a way that actually, if you ask the question that's in your mind and you don't make these special cases, somehow people always reveal a great sense of themselves. I, I guess I kind of go for that, right? Uh, when we were making Q2P, though we did see a woman bathing her 15 day old baby with the water from the bathroom and from the public bathroom and we interviewed her and we shot it and I'm perpetually uncomfortable with that sequence in the film. I know it's very heart-rending and that seems to matter to people more than everything else which makes me uncomfortable about the way people make sense of politics like at the cost of seeing somebody else's heart-rending situation but I did find that very difficult to shoot and to and to look at and think about. Thank <laughs> हिंदुस्तान की महिला जो डॉक्टरी पढ़ने के लिए विदेश जाना चाहती थी उसको लिटिगेशन में भी जाना पड़ा और उसको अपने हस्बैंड को भी छोड़ने की शर्त लगाई गई तो ये एक मतलब ये फैक्ट हम लोगों को नहीं मालूम थे और जब विश्व महिला दिवस आता है तब कुछ बातें महिलाओं के अचीवमेंट के बारे में की जाती हैं लेकिन उन्होंने जो संघर्ष किया है उसके बारे में कोई चर्चा नहीं होती है तो 
तो इससे हम लोगों को लगता है कि हमें महिलाओं के योगदान को दोबारा से पढ़ने की आवश्यकता है और जो इसमें हमने जो देखा जो बहुत सारी किताबों के नाम दिमाग में बैठा लिए मैं समझता हूँ उसको दोबारा से हम लोग कोशिश करेंगे पढ़ेंगे आपका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद शुक्रिया शुक्रिया नहीं और आपकी बात सही है कि एक्चुअली पढ़ने के लिए बहुत कुछ है जो हम भी खुद नहीं पढ़ते हैं राइट लाइक मुझे लगता है कि हर साल अंतर्राष्ट्रीय महिला दिवस पे या सावित्री बाई फूले के बर्थडे पे तो कुछ कुछ ऐसे मौके आते हैं वैन पीपल मैंशन द हिस्ट्री ऑफ वुमेन्स वर्क इन इंडिया राइट बट रिसेंटली एट एजेंस ऑफ विश वी बिन डूइंग सम लाइक हिस्टोरिकल रिसर्च टाइप थिंग्स एंड वी बिन रीडिंग ऑल द स्टफ अबाउट पीपल इन द नाइनटीन सेंचुरी एंड आई मीन रकमा बाई इज़ वन But there is such an incredible cast of characters of that time, men and women, who are fighting around marriage law and many other things. So I also feel like we are kind of deprived because we never bother to look beyond a certain canon, and we look at women's stories always in terms of victims and heroes. So we don't get these really exciting lives that would actually be very meaningful for us to understand our own in the contemporary moment. You know. So. <clears throat> Uh, hi paramita paramita ma'am so at the onset i would like to say you have interwoven you are interwoven the stories very in a very nice manner but i just wanted to know so i feel it's a film which was ahead of its time now we have social media and now twitter facebook whatsapp snapchat and what not but the the kind of way in which you had given that narration to the so the the textual conversation which was happening between different women mm. so can you just elaborate on how you think from 2000s from early 2000s to now when social media facebook came in 2005 twitter also came around somewhere around that time and i remember i, I used to have a, like long conversations with my girlfriend on the topic of feminism and we used to debate on that but i would like to know how you think it has changed from early 2000s to now we are about to enter into 2020 within 50 days hmm. and uh, second uh, how <laughs> that is a no, scary so, thing to say wow. <laughs> <laughs> and apocalypse <laughs> how how would you uh, suggest young filmmakers to try to think of concepts which are ahead of their time like the way you have done back in 20 almost 20 years back <laughs> looking forward to response so you know john waters who's a filmmaker i really love and whose interviews i can read all day basically has said this thing that no artist is ahead of their time artists are always of their time and i do think that unlimited girls is very much a film of its time it's not ahead of its time because all the stuff that's in the film was happening right then right but what john waters also says is its audiences that are behind the times <laughs> so <laughs> and the work of art in a way is to mirror our times to ourselves right i mean i think all you're saying really is that uh, the film was had the innocence or dared to or whatever foolishness to make a film in a way that wasn't conventionally being made before right uh, and i think nobody can teach you that but you have to feel it very urgently i felt very much like making a film out of the stuff that i liked rather than making it just like i was told my earlier films in this are far more conventional i think so there's also a process by which you arrive at it's not like it was my first film you know uh in terms of the internet i think there is a very big difference i think the internet was an innocent place at one level it was it was a place of innocence and play uh it was not so corporate owned so in a way like lots of us who were flotsam and jetsam were roaming around the internet we didn't really feel we fitted in and belonged that much anywhere else but on the internet you always found some sort of community or place of interest i used to actually be part of what was called a listserv i'm sure many people in this room don't know what it is a few might but a list server was basically a chat room that came into your in inbox right on email like in a digest format so it was called sonnet and it was south asian women's network and there were lots of arguments in that so that slightly inspired the chat room uh, along with real chat rooms in uh, unlimited girls um and i think that there was a lot of space for playfulness on the internet which i responded to very strongly i think from then to now what the internet has become it continues to be a place of connections and possibilities and newness i won't say that it is not but because it's so much more controlled right like it's totally driven by corporate logic there's so much it is now a place of surveillance it's not a place where you go to play and explore who you are not easily able to be in the light right now you have to show everything you are and the whole point of life is that i should not have to show everything that i am to anybody except through my own choice right so this thing of the anonymity of the internet vanishing is actually emblematic of so many of the freedoms to just kind of figure it out that it typified vanishing right 
And I again will say that it's not that it doesn't continuously lead to new things. Now, for example, there's been this big exodus from Twitter to something called Mastodon mm -hmm. in the last few days, right? But really, when I go and see it, I think that the only difference is that right now the moderators on Mastodon say we'll kick out anybody who harasses you. But what freedom is that really? Like, so you've got a nice mummy and daddy to take care of you, right? So this desire to be, you know, actually that unfettered roaming around in a not altogether safe and sanitary place was what was so important about the early internet. The desire to make it a very, very sanitary space right now gives me a lot, it disturbs me a lot because everything is about sanitizing. It's about sanitizing your speech. You didn't say the politically correct thing. I don't agree with this. So it's not, I mean, it may seem polarized between left and right, but in fact, it's very unified in the act of sanitization, classification by corporates, and then all of us playing into that algorithm, right? So you can say I'm aware of the algorithm and keep trying to game it. But you know that you're going to game it like about 0.0000000001%, if that, right? So I think that's a very big difference between the internet then and now. Uh, but I guess there are, you know, like new possibilities, new impossibilities. It's a bit like that. I have a question about, about the process of making unlimited girls. And uh, so what was it like? I know a lot of it, of course, is scripted. You can see that. Uh, you know, did you begin with a plan? There were, were there any temporal shifts while you were doing this? Did the film take meaning of its own, you know, what was that like? So, I mean, I think, yeah, as you can see, Unlimited Girls is very scripted. So a lot of time was spent in research and thinking about it. Uh, I mean, for a long time, the film was called Project Feminism. Mm -hmm. Like all my films are always called Project Toilet, Project something yeah. like that. But, you know, if I go back and look at those notes, I'm sure mm -hmm. I'll see that it didn't change in essence in a big way. But of course, it changes a lot, right? So uh, it was always planned as having a chat room, having those commercial breaks mm -hmm. and having like whatever other things in the film, they were planned from the outset. And uh, the film couldn't have been made the way it is. I, I don't think you can suddenly plug in any of these elements, right? Maybe you could, I don't know. But um, we shot it in, we allowed actually the nonfiction to guide mm -hmm. how those elements would shape mm -hmm. up. So it's not as if the whole script was written and then just filmed. So after research, I knew whom I was going to interview. Um, I knew I wanted to try out this interviewing style where I would do long conversational interview, mm -hmm. not do that very traditional interview. Yeah. So that means each interview would be committing to two, two and a half hours. I've gotten a bit better at that method now. So I don't take such a long time. But at that time, I was trying it out. Like I didn't quite know mm -hmm. how will this conversational interview be? Like how does one achieve it? Um, and uh, after the interviews were done, we edited them and we, you know, kept shuffling to come up with the structure of the film that we felt convinced by. And after that, we shot the ads because then we knew at which place they were going to come. And then I wrote the ads after that, right. that, oh, we want an ad about this theme, this theme and this theme. And then we shot the chat, we wrote and then shot the chat rooms. And last of all, we shot all the interstitial material of Fearless at home and frying fish and all those other sequences. So that's the order in which the film was made. I mean, obviously in terms of its thinking, like I think Jabin has been at Urban Lens and I'm sure she has told many torture stories of working on this film. Like it was very arduous experience because it was in an earlier era of digital, which was not that easy also like FCP2 and everything taking a very long time compared to now. Um, there was almost a hundred hours of footage. Uh, we used every sequence we shot except one sequence we shot in Balaji telephones. And uh, otherwise, yeah, which is very sad that we couldn't use it uh, because it was an interview with an actress and she said, I like my Manga Sutra very much. It's modern on one side and traditional on the other. And we kept on trying to use it. We kept on come, trying to use it. How come you didn't use it? We tried very hard, but then it just didn't sort of fit in the overall thing of the film. So we had to like very late in life, we removed it. But it was the only sequence we didn't include in the film. Um, but of course, you know, like our own understanding of things kept growing and uh, we kept re-editing inside each thing uh, but but I think yeah mostly maybe when we started out there might have been a more clever kind of approach and it became a, a more like it thickened into something a little bit more thoughtful as we went along because you know then more people also come into the film right at first it's just you and the camera person and sound recorders and you feel a certain way then the editor comes in the editor asks you a lot of challenging questions and you have to think about that and respond to it they develop their own relationship to the material so you're both you're not doing it just on your own anymore. So I think all that changes. And with Unlimited Girls, we were very, uh, like we showed the rough cut to a lot of people and we were very serious about taking their responses and trying to make sure that the film 
you know it speaks to people it shouldn't i mean because the thing is that what we were making was to ha ha banayenge banayenge after the first uh, rough cut was done i became very depressed and scared that like oh god like what is this should we be doing this people might laugh at us right so there's also the fear that actually it won't work etc which set in later uh, is better to have the fear later than before because if you have it before you don't even try Absolutely. but afterwards yeah. you're like ab to bana liya ab to karna hi padega that has not uh, that behavior has not improved in me at all uh, but so yeah i think like in essence i'll say the film didn't change dramatically from what it set out to be uh, and it was the most it was the second most scripted film that i ever made the most scripted film i made mukul shot actually called morality tv or loving jihad was a shot exactly to script and we only shot 14 hours so yeah <laughs> i just wanted to ask about the um, scene where you interviewed the couple mm. uh and the woman who um said that she thought of herself as independent and was she aware of how she would be placed within the film because i i was just thinking about you know you began the film by um talking about your reluctance i mean not i mean whatever there's the character who's questioning the feminist label but mm-hmm. then i also think that once you and this is just from personal experience like once you accept that you are a feminist then there's also the fear of losing that perspective you know of uh, what if i'm co-opted and I, which i think the film brings out really well this feeling of different worlds and having to negotiate them but um what if you you are not aware of your own co-option and when we when i watched that scene i was a little uncomfortable with oh no what if um is she aware of how we are perceiving her or like is there and are there times when people perceive me a certain way and i'm not aware of my own like context and reality you know no i agree with you it's like that discomfort is there because it was obviously a very tez nazar on her right uh, and i think like one of the ways we found out of that discomfort was to retain the questions i think that sequence was very important in uh my feeling i'm like jabeen saying that i mean jabeen did say while we were editing this film for instance that you have to keep your questions in because you do interviews in a very particular way and so it's necessary that i mean sometimes you ask very odd questions also and like people should know that that's the nazar that is making the film and i think in this sequence when i was quite rude to anya and i also had a fight with her uh and you know it's very obvious that she was i was feeling irritated by her etc and she was feeling irritated by me also uh, so i feel like that tension be retained so that you can also be a little judgmental of the filmmaker but that said you know i don't want to be disingenuous there is a way in which the filmmaker has a power over the material that the person who's in the material doesn't really have so that i think that discomfort and dissonance is very correct and true to feel um ananya knew how she because both she and shirish were like oh uh, you are a feminist yeah yeah we know that you are uh, going to like you know fix us type of thing uh, but we are also very feminist you know so there was this kind of contest happening definitely uh, they have of course seen the film and uh, smiled and all that <laughs> when they saw it so i think there was an awareness about how it would be seen for sure yeah it's it's a, i would say i agree with you all your discomforts including how we start thinking about how others are thinking of us yeah I think we are done with time. Thank you so much Parumita. Thank you very again. much.